Matthew chapter 6 this morning. If you need a Bible to follow along, you can raise your hand and one of the ushers will bring you one. Matthew chapter 6, looking at verses 16 through 24. As you know, if you've been here, we're going through the gospel according to Matthew here on Sunday mornings. And in chapter 6, Jesus is teaching his disciples about the kingdom of God. As we look at verses 16 through 24 this morning, I am always struck by the reality of how Jesus is still teaching his disciples even today through the Sermon on the Mount. He's teaching me today through the Sermon on the Mount, which started in chapter 5, goes through chapter 7. And in this, Jesus is contrasting how the religious rulers had turned what God had taught the Jewish people into a religious ritual that wasn't from the heart. It had no spiritual meaning. As Jesus brings out the truth of the the heart of man and began in chapter 6 teaching about the common spiritual disciplines of, of giving and praying and now today fasting. As these disciplines were practiced by those who wanted to seek God. And they still are today. Not only in Christianity, but in other religions as well. As practicing these disciplines has the ability to change one's perspective or focus in life. And I believe are extremely beneficial. Especially to the Christian believer. Because... Our faith system is based in the truth or the reality of the risen Savior. Not a dead orthodoxy, but a living Savior. Based on the reality of the work of the Holy Spirit in us. Because our souls are cleansed from the effects of sin. Allowing us to be born again. We're born by God's Spirit in believing believing the good news, the gospel, that Jesus took our sins upon himself at the cross, cleansing our soul of sin, allowing the Holy Spirit of God to indwell our being, our soul, giving us a new nature and eternal life, all through faith in Christ. So as Jesus now teaches about these common spiritual disciplines, He reveals the issue of people that were practicing these things for the wrong reason. Mainly to be seen by other people so that others would think they were special or deeply spiritual. He said that when folks do that for that reason, they have their reward to be seen by people. But he implies here that God the Father desires to reward these spiritual disciplines and will. When done with the right heart or the right motive in our lives. So let's continue in in verse 16 as Jesus teaches about fasting. As we know, fasting in this context is refraining from eating food for a period of time to set aside the bodily or the fleshly appetites for a time of seeking God by denying that basic carnal need in us, humbling ourselves before God. I've found in my Christian walk, it's difficult to humble ourselves through various things in life. And there are ways, and this is one surefire way to tell your body, you're not going to eat till I tell you to eat because I'm going to seek the Lord. And this this brings this spiritual side to, to the forefront of our soul and of our being. As Jesus says here in verse 16, Moreover, when you fast, do not be like the hypocrites with a sad countenance, for they disfigure their faces that they may appear to men to be fasting. Assuredly, I say to you, they have their reward. But you, when you fast, 
anoint your head and wash your face so that you do not appear to men to be fasting, but your Father who is in the secret place and your Father who sees in secret will reward you openly. Man, that's heavy duty. It's another one of those places where Jesus makes a promise like that that just gives you goosebumps. And the first thing we notice here is that Jesus assumes his disciples will practice fasting as a part of being a disciple of Jesus. As again, this was a normal part of the Jewish religious life at that time. Because in the Old Testament, we see numerous mentions of, of fasting when people were in deeply serious places. They, they needed to hear from God especially in the life of David, who mentions he was in a place of fasting several times in the book of Psalms. As Moses was also called to a 40-day fast in receiving the law of God on Mount Sinai, he needed absolute clarity. God knew it and God gave it to him, along with Jesus himself, in the wilderness before his public ministry began. And when Jesus was asked why his disciples didn't fast by the religious rulers and the disciples of John the Baptist, we see from the Gospels of Mark and Luke, Jesus said they were not fasting because the bridegroom, speaking of himself, was present. But when the bridegroom departed, then they would fast. And we know those in the early church from the book of Acts were fasting and waiting upon the Lord when, the, when Paul and Barnabas were sent out on Paul's first mission journey, Paul mentions to the Corinthian church that he was often in a place of fasting. So the only place we see fasting in a negative light is here, when Jesus said they were doing this to be seen by people as spiritual. The same things in the disciplines of giving and in prayer that we've been covering. The three basic spiritual disciplines of people that are serious about God. And what I find interesting is that in the New Testament church, we are not directly commanded to give or to pray or to fast. But it is implied that we would as we follow Jesus. I think that's true because if we were directly commanded in these areas, it would become like a law or a religious thing, another outward religious practice that would not come from the heart, a heart that says, man, I need more of God in my life. I'm being ruled by, by the flesh in my life, and I don't have that deeply spiritual place that I want. So God leaves it up to us to seek God, to be like God in our giving, to draw near to God as Christ did and to have this special sensitivity to the things of the Spirit in our life. Remember, Jesus said the Father seeks those that will worship Him in spirit and in truth from the Gospel of John. As it seems, man, at least from my concept, has three basic parts to man's being. We have, of course, his physical body. We have a soul or inner being that the Bible calls sometimes the heart. We have a, a spirit with our soul and our heart connecting all three into one to make that complete being. And just as we take care of and nurture our physical and emotional needs, there are spiritual needs needs as well. But when our lives are driven and ruled by our physical and emotional needs, then the spiritual side of us suffers and diminishes. It literally starves. And as we all recognize the importance of being fed the Word of God for that spiritual food, it's nourishing the, the soul in us, we also see the need to serve God in some capacity, in, in generally a sacrificial way that keeps this real to us. 
and, and doesn't make it a religious orthodoxy, but it makes it a part of our reality in life. There is also a need for fasting that balances out the constant demands our body puts on our soul, bringing a sensitivity to the things of the spirit and keeping our physical issues in the right perspective, a balanced Christian life. Exampled and taught by Jesus and the Apostle Paul in the New Testament. But from what I see as a pastor, this area of fasting is neglected by most believers in Christ. Why? Well, because it's incredibly hard on that carnal side of us, that flesh uh, in our being. And I've also come to learn that the devil hates it when people will, will put their life on hold and seek God in this way. The devil will try to stop any believer from committing to a regular time of fasting in their walk with Jesus, which really tells us a lot about fasting. I think the Lord impressed this upon me years ago as I was talking to Pastor Isaac. And, and we were fasting, and, and he's like, I don't know why we're fasting. It just makes me hungry. <laughs> and I looked at him, and I went, what? <laughs> and, you know, we, we battle those logical places in us. And I'm like, Re remember that work of the Spirit. It was at that time the Lord impressed upon me how much the devil hates this. And in my, you know, German mind, and just stubborn. I mean, I, I would beat my head against a wall till I died. I'm that stubborn. God impressed that upon me because I said, I hate to fast. It makes me sick. I, I just loathe it. But if the devil hates it, I'm going to do it. <laughs> you know, the German stubbornness in me has, has brought me to that and motivated me in that place because I realize how much it's needed in my life. And I'm not going to tell you to fast. I'll just tell you the truth about it. And I'll tell you that Jesus was implying that his disciples would fast. I recommend that if you don't practice fasting for the purpose of drawing near to Jesus, that you begin to pray. You begin to ask him for the desire for this in your life as it's a work of the spirit. I, I have to fa pray before I enter fasting because my flesh will stop me. I mean, it'll just dead on stop me. I won't tell you how, but <laughs> it does. And uh, in that place, I want that, that deeper spirituality in my, my life because I don't consider myself a real super spiritual person. Uh, my wife and I practice regular times of fasting together, um, not because we're more spiritual. I think we realize that we're not. We, we just want this in our life, and we know God's called us to lead a church, and we want to draw near to him in spirit and in truth, and we just don't know of any other way to do it. And in that place, we, we pray and ask God for that strength. It's something that we choose, but it's something the Spirit facilitates. I'm telling you, it gives us a greater awareness of His presence that is here all the time, but for the most part is not sensed by the average believer. As I'm convinced that a regular time of fasting heightens our sensitivity to the things of the Spirit. It allows us to recognize the sound of his voice in our soul. Jesus said, my sheep hear my voice. Have you heard it lately? My wife and I usually eat an early meal here on Wednesdays with the church, and uh, then we refrain from food on Thursday and eat again early that Thursday evening before worship team practice. It's about 24 hours without food. Uh, generally, we just drink water. Um, I, I sometimes have some tea in the afternoon, I, but I call it the wimpy Pastor Joe fast, and you can write that down. 
the wimpy Pastor Joe fast because we start at sundown Wednesday because the Jewish day starts at sundown. And we end at sundown on Thursday. So, or in that evening time period. So we're only missing breakfast and lunch, which seems doable for a wimpy guy like me. <laughs> it's, it's true, I'm sorry. Um, but uh, th this can easily expand into a three or four day fast. Uh, I've spent several times in, fa in extended fasting. I'm not in the recent few years, but uh, or as an early Christian, if you begin to practice this in your life, it can easily lead you into a three or four day fast. The first three days are the most difficult. By the time you reach the fourth to fifth day, you receive a clarity that you've never had in your conscience before. By the fifth day, you will have such clarity about who you are and what you're doing in this world and what God is doing, you won't want to stop fasting. I would generally end those fasts on the seventh day because I would have to go back to work. And sometimes after the seventh day, you go through another chemical thing where you lose some, some cognitive uh, abilities. Like on the third day, and, you know, with the type of job I had, I couldn't uh, make mistakes or I would kill people. So I would end the fast with just eating a piece of wheat bread with nothing on it and some water, slowly letting my body get used to and restarting the digestive system. Because if you don't do it that way, it can really make you sick. I'll tell you about it later. So uh, just a few tips about this is something that's generally doing it. I mean, if you've tried fasting and you've become faint or ill, that's completely normal. That's the first and second day. And unless you have some type of verified clinical mesh, medical issue, some folks have to take medication with food, um, you should be able to do a wimpy Pastor Joe fast. As Jesus implied his disciples would do, and I recommend it be done through a commitment to Jesus because even the wimpy Pastor Joe fast is, it, 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 we have such a bad habit of making excuses to ourselves. And man, if I make that commitment Wednesday night after I eat, Lord, I want to commit this time to fasting. I pray on my way home from church because immediately I start getting hit with just spiritual stuff. And then by noon the next day, it can get really bad. And I'm like, you know, I don't care. If the devil doesn't like this, then good. And if my body is, is, is going through whatever it goes through, then good. Because this is a commitment to Jesus, and I can do this through Christ who strengthens me. It'll benefit our lives tremendously. So I encourage you, especially if you want to grow in Christ, you want to hear his voice, pray about this discipline in your spiritual life. It will pay great dividends, just as Jesus said from this text, the Father, in that secret or spiritual place in your life will reward you openly. That's a pretty serious promise. That's something that, that I wanted in my life and I don't want to do it through fasting, but I haven't found any other way. And if you're a leader here or serving in this ministry, I would say this is an essential discipline to keep clarity and direction as the evil one hates it when we serve God in a spiritual way, and he works through our flesh and our emotions to stop us from serving God, and he usually does, unless those folks have this kind of discipline in their life. And finally, on this matter, we don't fast or pray to get what we want from God. We pray and fast so that we have an understanding of what God is doing. Even though a time of fasting, I believe, greatly enhances our spiritual depth and prayer life. But for me, it's not during the fasting. It's afterwards. 
I seem to, to, in my prayer life, I'm connecting better. And I also connect in prayer deeper when I'm praying with others. I'm not sure why. You know, it's my lack of concentration. I begin to pray, and the next thing I know, I'm 19 years old surfing at Huntington Beach again. You know, it's just like, ah, come back. But when I pray with others, I hear people pray, and I concentrate on their prayer. I'm communing with them. So I recommend all these techniques that uh, this time of fasting does enhance our spiritual life, but we don't want to twist God's arm to do anything. It's always best to know God's will and then affirm that through prayer. Fasting enables us to see spiritually in a more focused way, which, you know, conversely leads us to the next issue. Jesus goes here in verse 19, and I don't think it was a coincidence. As Jesus then says, Starting in verse 19, do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth or rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal, but lay up for yourselves treasure in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Treasures in heaven. Don't you just love the sound of that? Treasures in heaven. Speaking of what is precious to us personally, something of eternal value, something that is eternally secure and value to, valuable to us now and then. As it seems from what Jesus taught, treasure in heaven can be diminished if a person focuses and concentrates on storing up for themselves treasures on earth. Something valuable that is not secure. Something that can be destroyed or lost through the issues of life. We live in a fallen world, in a fallen society and culture. I'm surprised we do as well as we do. But it's not that way in heaven. It's secure and eternal forever. Jesus affirms this to his disciples, that they can store up this treasure in heaven where it is eternally secure and belongs to them. As I don't see any hidden, uh, spiritually deep or esoteric meaning here, that basically if our focus on life is getting for ourselves and and getting all the precious treasure we can, we will minimize our ability to acquire or store treasure in heaven. But the giving of our, our time, our energy, our resources to the things of God in this life, instead of the things of self, is what Jesus is talking about. A real simple concept. As Jesus certainly isn't prohibiting acquiring things in this life through a prayerful, God-honoring way, but simply laying out a basic philosophical foundation. You can't take it with you, but you can send it ahead. Really simple teaching, isn't it? And the reality of it is he's there. He said, I go to prepare a place for you. And I would think where we can enjoy that treasure. Whatever it is that he's going to, you know, change that in heaven for us. It's a pretty amazing concept. I look at it like investing in something secure and good. Every financial investor that's a Christian, man, they want that. I want something that's secure and I want something that's good. Most financial advisors say, rot's a ruck. I remember bailing out of a mutual fund one time because like two-thirds of it was invested in ungodly stuff. When I finally looked at the portfolio, I went, I can't do this. I'm not going to support the liquor industry and the abortion industry and all of these things. I'm, you know, like the financial guy was like, well, you know, it's just not that way here. And I'm like, well, we're going to invest in another way. 
in a way that Jesus said. It's the only way I can find. If my focus in life is, is on what is eternal and important, it's going to make a difference in what I do in this life. Investing in something secure and good, uh, as many of you know, um, when we invest in a market, we watch that market pretty closely, especially when it's just tanking. And like the go, there goes half of my 401k retirement right there in one day. So everybody hold still, don't do anything. It's going to come back, right? Well, we hope so. <laughs> the giving of our time, our energy and resources, that's our investment in something good and secure. An investment that God graciously allows us to partake in. He doesn't owe us anything. But if my focus is on what is eternal and important is not clear, it's cloudy, usually because of my lack of seriously seeking the heart of God through the word and through prayer facilitated by times of fasting. Remember bringing that clarity? It's seeking the heart of the Father. Then I can easily seek and invest in the wrong things in life. I see people do it all the time. Investing in temporary things that will not last. As we see from the book of Revelation, chapter 16, everything that we see physical will dissolve in a fervent heat as God brings a new heavens and a new earth. Peter verified this from 2 Peter chapter 3, verses 11 and 12. It's where that term came from, it'll all burn. Peter said it'll melt with a fervent heat before God brings his, his kingdom, the new heavens and the new earth. So what manner of lives should we live with that kind of information? What am I going to invest in? Am I going to throw everything to this life? Or am I going to invest in that life, that eternal life? It only makes sound investment um, uh, logic to me. Because it's the truth. Because Jesus said it was. The word of God reve re reveals it's true. As I look at these things as in this logical mind as an investment. Because I really believe that heaven is coming. Because Jesus said so. Remember, where your treasure is, there your heart is as well. The heart, the soul, our inner being, as the heart of man directs the affections and the attention of man. If you've invested in one of the markets available, as I said, man, you just pay attention to it. But if you're investing in the kingdom of God, there your heart is your heart, your soul. I'm not saying not to invest. The Bible actually teaches that we should invest in this life. But the Bible says to guard your heart, for out of it comes the issues or the direction for your life. Proverbs chapter 4, verse 23, to divest in investments. We want to use money wisely. It's been said that money is an is a awesome servant but a cruel master. Guard your hearts, for where your treasure is, there your heart is as well. Why? Because verse 22. It's so, it just blows my mind how all these things, these principles build on each other as we go through this text. Because verse 22, Jesus said, the lamp of the body is the eye. Therefore, if your eye is good, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If therefore the light that is in you is darkness, how great is that darkness? Oh man, don't you just love that passage? This is one of those passages that has, has word pictures in it. It's not a parable, but it has very distinct illustrative pictures it takes a close examination and it has to be taken in context. 
The meaning of all of these things come from the context of verse 16 through 24. The meaning of the light of what Jesus declared. The lamp it represents the light, right? It's the light of the body. The body represents your life. Everything about your life. The eye is how we see things. It's our perception, how we perceive realities and the truth of God. Recognizing that we come from a fallen state before we put our inner trust by a faith choice in the cross of Christ. And as we experience the regeneration of the Holy Spirit of God in us, we have tons of perceptual issues to work through with this new nature we have in Christ, right? Just an example. Think about how you see things today versus of how you saw things before you were a believer. Man, for me, it's like a 180 degree turn. My perceptions have changed that much and they're still changing. God is still changing that perception in my life. And that's why I need that clarity through fasting that God's not done with me yet. And there's more that he wants me to see. This light, this lamp. These are the very issues Jesus is directly confronting to his disciples on the Sermon on the Mount. So if our perception of life is being directed and changed by the Holy Spirit and the Word of God, that I, or the way we see things, is going to be good. Verse 22, and our lives are going to be full of light. Full of light. The light in this context represents truth. Light and truth are, are synonymous spiritually. That truth is what transforms our lives. It's that light that we yield to that is revealed by God through the word and confirmed in the Holy Spirit and, and brought, bringing clarity through fasting and all of it. But it says, if our eye or perception of life is bad or darkened or cloudy or foggy, that word darkened can mean out of focus, either by sin or lies. We're surrounded by lies all around us through our culture, demonic lies. It says your whole life will be full of darkness. Speaking of spiritual darkness from the context of this teaching, so that the lies of darkness pervade or control our whole life. As the Apostle Paul verified from 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 3 through 6, dealing with spiritual warfare, the lies of the evil one that keep people from embracing the truth, the light of God, walking in the light as he is in the light. I want you to know we are all susceptible to those lies. They are strongholds that exalt themselves against the knowledge of God. Paul said, again, 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 3 through 6. They exalt themselves against the knowledge of God in us, where the only deliverance comes from taking every thought, every philosophy, every practice, every endeavor, every perception into the obedience of Christ. And it all begins right here in the Sermon on the Mount. For this is God, the Son, speaking to man even today. We can't find any higher authority for truth in life, can we? And to me, that's exhilarating. I don't have to go anywhere else to find the truth. I just have to seek it in a serious way because I've been affected by those lies and so have you. If you've ever gone to Disneyland, it's happened to you. I say that because Pastor Isaac is at Disneyland. 
You know, they, life presents this, this false picture. It's presented as the American dream that enslaves billions of people every year to live for something that's not a reality. It's all going to burn. It's not real. It's temporary. We use it for his kingdom and to, to try to get through this place as best we can. The reality is coming, and it's called heaven. This is the message of Jesus to his disciples. As far as being content in life, as I know, that's an issue that comes to our minds when we read this passage. Being content in life usually comes through the things we fill our lives with. Again, the great apostle Paul taught that we should be content with what we have. And that begins with being thankful and reverent with what God has provided. We mentioned this in our men's group Tuesday night. Something struck me yesterday. I was at the store, and that teaching came back to my mind. Joe, be thankful with what you've got because this is what God has provided. It completely took away all whatever that stuff was that was hitting me. Joe, be thankful for what you've got, because this is what God has given you. And a feeling of contentment came over me. What a great key in life. How, do you, how, how to be content? Be thankful, because God has given you a lot. In the times of Jesus, when he talked about the rust, destroying some of the, the precious little metal things they would get or whatever, they didn't have rust-oleum. So things would rust and Oftentimes, if someone had two full changes of nice clothes, they were considered well-to-do, but they didn't have any way to stop the moths. You know, raw cloth and everything, moths just love it. And they'll just eat through stuff like crazy. So they knew what Jesus was talking about. I wonder if we do. This picture of moth and rust today just is a picture of the fallen world we live in. It's, it's in a, a state of depreciation. You know, like, like a new car. <laughs> you know, three years later, it's like, it's worth what? <laughs> you know? So, you know, we recommend don't buy a new car. <laughs> you know, unless you, you just want to lose a few thousand bucks, then, you know, go ahead. But So in those places, we're taught the truth of God that applies to our lives today. This perspective of being content. And if we feel that we need something in life that will benefit or enhance our lives somehow, we learn to lift that up to God in prayer. We allow God to bring that to us in various ways that God opens that door, confirms those things so that we're not constantly seeking more things, but we are constantly seeking God. Seeking God who desires to bless our lives on so many different levels. God is not a stingy ogre that he wants to bless our lives beyond anything we could hope for or imagine, beginning with security. Man, if you are secure in Christ today, you are a blessed human being. If you're trying to be secure in this world, I feel sorry for you because it's changing and it's changing for the worse. Things are always happening because of all the demonic stuff that God is allowing in order to bring forth his truth and to help people get saved. You know, we talked about that uh, Tuesday night as well, that God turns people over to sinful things so that they will be sick of sinful things and come to Christ. It's not to punish them. It's to help them come to the truth. This is the nature of God. One of the truths that came out of this study that our perspective toward material things will make a huge difference in our spiritual life. Let me say it again. Our perspective toward material things will make a huge difference in our spiritual life. And I'm not the, you know, the materialism guru. I I'm still praying through everything in life that I don't trust my own judgments and my own abilities. I want to seek God through 
fasting and prayer and have a sensitivity because we can throw away a lot of money on, on worthless things. Guys, have you ever bought a tool that you knew you just had to have and it's set in that toolbox for years? Oh, I hate that. Man, I'm like, I see the tool. I'm like, don't, don't say it. I had to have that tool, you know? And it just, oh, it drives me crazy. And God's saying, you know, you should have prayed through that. Because the store always has those tools. I used to save all my little screws and bolts and stuff and everywhere and there'd be cans of them and God said, that's why I made hardware stores. <laughs> you know, you're, you're, you're being obsessive, you know, compulsive. Look at you. You know, I want you to enjoy life. So yeah, we're pretty messed up. Or at least I am, so I need to fast and pray often, right? Well, Jesus finishes this, this statement here in verse 24, and he tells us, no one can serve two masters, for either he will hate one or love the other, or else he will be loyal to one and despise the other. And here's the clincher. You cannot serve God and mammon. As this sums up this whole section, into the core issue, what do we serve in life? This is the issue. What do we serve in life? It's in the context of what we work for, what we sacrifice for, as we generally sacrifice every single day for the things we really want. And it seems it is important for us to identify who or what we serve from this passage. As Jesus boils it down to either serving God or serving mammon. Mammon is a word that, that points to material riches or material things, what we work for. So what do we serve? That's the question. Jesus asks these questions through implication as he teaches the truth of God. He wants us to come to the answer through prayer and fasting God what am I serving in life? I don't want to throw my life away here because you redeemed it through your sacrifice on the cross. That means something to me. And we begin to seek the heart of God in this deeper place. Oftentimes we rationalize in our mind and think, well, I have to, to work. I have to, to manage my income, whether I'm retired or not. But the question is, what do I serve? Am I serving my own concepts in life, my own desires or wants, or am I focused on serving God? Is that the core reason I'm alive? These are important issues for us to consider, although uncomfortable at best, because we're dealing with our perception of God in our hearts, in our souls, how real God is to us. And this is a difficult place. My wife and I have worked through these places many times. We feel that we've been so materially blessed, we literally feel guilty because of, you know, just the, the material blessings we've had. We, we pray, we, we seek the Lord. God, have we taken too much? Are, I, have, we, have we not contained this in the light of your truth and we pray through it several times especially my wife has a sensitive spirit and she's like man we've been blessed so much i feel bad there there are people in the middle east right now living in bombed out cities in southern syria i mean no resources whatsoever i'm like well that's why we follow god's finance plan we we return a tenth to the Lord. We, we pray for our church leadership that they'll invest in these missions groups. And we're a part of this. We're doing what God wants us to do. And I feel bad too. Wish there was something I could do. I often think if I had gazillions of dollars, I would fly plane loads of stuff in there and help these people. But then there would be the Syrian government who says, I want 30%. And I would probably pay them. It's like we do when we take trailers to Mexico. 
you know, $200. I'm like, $200 for what? It's your permit to bring clothes in. What permit? It's the permit for today. And they only take cash. <laughs> I told our group last time, just take 200 bucks. Don't even, just take 200 bucks. <laughs> you know, go to a bank machine, get 200 bucks. So. These are difficult places because they're spiritual places. They can become clouded with so many things in life, especially in our culture. We're, we're not just surviving here. We, we are living opulent lives compared to most people on this earth. It's a difficult place. It's a place that the devil and this fallen world love to have a heyday with a believer in Christ. Places that can be unclear, foggy, or even guilt-ridden in a myriad of excuses we make to ourselves in the light of that question. Who is our master? Is it us? Or God, you can't have both. And I can tell you that only the word of God and the work of the Holy Spirit can bring us to a place of solid understanding and peace in our lives before God. And when we consistently seek God in times of fasting and prayer, we will get that solid witness of the truth of God in our lives. It'll be clear. You remember the illustration of a tall glass of water and one drop of dye? What does it do to the huge glass of water? It makes it cloudy. That's what this world is doing to us. That we're cloudy, we're not clear. This, this fasting will clear up those places in our lives and, and God is, is going to continue to bless us for the truth of the witness of God in our lives leading us to a place of worshiping God in spirit and in truth, which I believe we all want. I think we want that. And I've only found one way to get it. As God said from the writer of Hebrews, as we close here, in Hebrews 11:6, that God is a rewarder of those who would seek him in this diligent way, this, this serious, this consecrated, sacrificial way. They said, God, I am serious about this, and I'm going to shut down the carnal part of my life on a regular basis because I need clarity. Because I'm still in a fast, a wimpy faster, Pastor Joe fast. I need that clarity in my life. I'm leading a family, I'm leading a church. Uh, I'm leading a life that I'll give an account for. I need clarity, God. And he has promised that to us. So as we consider these things, I want to ask the music ministers to come. Would you please stand with me? We'll dim the lights as we just bring our hearts to the Lord this morning, considering all of this. And you can tell God what you want. You can let him know what it is you want. That's why we're here, to beseech the throne of God, to come boldly before his throne today and just be real with him because he gave it all for us. We never have to hide. We never have to make excuses. I love that about Jesus. I can just tell him, man, I'm the most carnal person I know. Why would you ever make me a pastor? And he laughs <laughs> because it keeps you close to me, Joe. You know that. It keeps you close to me. So God, we bring these things to you today. Work in our hearts as we close now. Send us out today with joy in knowing that you have all the answers. And if we seek you, you will reward us with that clarity. And people will see that clarity in our lives. And they're going to want to know how we can be so clear in a muddy place. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you. I want to seek you. I want to seek you first. I want to keep you. I want to keep you first.
into their hearts. Lord, if we've been struggling over these issues of fasting and prayer, hopefully this word will bring that clarity to know that you have so much more than what this world offers. Do a great work in our lives and reward us openly. And we'll always point to you. That's what God did in my life. His word is true. Bless your people as they go out now and they interact with folks in this community. There's so many people who are filled with darkness. Even those that say they believe in God. Their lives are cloudy and, and disturbed. They don't have any peace at all. Lord, help us to come alongside them and say, take my hand. I'm being discipled and I can disciple you. We want to follow Jesus. That's what it's all about. So bless us now as we go forth in your promise, in your word, in Jesus' name. God's people said, amen. Praise him today. We give you thanks, Lord. Praise your holy name.